everybody, welcome back to the Touch Tennis Show. Um, Rashid Ahmed, alongside me. Chris Eaton, how you doing? I'm really sorry about last Tuesday and there was no show. Um, I have a valid reason. Don't even talk to me. Hang on, <laughs> you went away to play golf once. Yes, yeah. but yes, last week I was here, I was knocking at the door, nobody would come in, it was raining outside. I mean, it's just so unprofessional. I have to apologise for my... Uh, colleague's lack of professionalism I would fire him but it's his house his equipment and his show so I can't (laughs) it is possible I I do think what will happen eventually hopefully and I pray for the day that I actually get fired um, because we're so big that we've got people like you know Kelly Brook presenting with you actually no not with you because we'd both (laughs) be in that room (laughs) with with a moist towel I, I mean to you know dry ourselves off from perspiring and glowing at the thought of having Kelly Brook out here. But can you imagine that? Kelly Brook in the dungeon. I mean, you know, in the back room. <laughs> Where's this going? No, I'm, that's not going anywhere. I just think, you know, it'd be great for our show to have somebody like that, you know, somebody of that quality, you know, presenting for us. It would, it would. And uh, it's been a couple of weeks, but uh, apart from what's been going on in the touch tennis world, which we'll come back to, we've got a little wrap of what happened in uh, Brunel, where I got hooked by Rob Gilmore. I mean, I've got video evidence. I'm going to put this up. Rob, you filthy, filthy scum. I knew you were hooking me, and I checked the video when I got back, and what did he say in his filthy, typical Essex tone? Well, I saw him out when I called him. It's quite difficult to argue with that, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know, but you wanted to see them out. They were in. My serves are very fast. They've got lots of kick. They drop last second, jump onto the line and bounce up. But some of them were this far in. I mean, I looked at the replays. They were this far in. And he called them out. I feel so sorry for you. Thanks. <laughs> What's been going on? Um, yeah, not much. Not much has been going on, actually. We missed, we missed a, a decent week to miss, really. Yeah. Um, it's now, obviously, Indian Wells is kind of halfway through um, so that's that's happening at the moment it's obviously a two week a two week deal um, and it's quite interesting seeing uh, seeing a big tournament with Rafa seeded five yeah um, so potentially if all the big players are in the right place certainly in the French Open probably in Wimbledon uh, he could have to play um, let me get this right he could have to play all three yeah Federer Murray Djokovic and, Djokovic and Murray to yeah. win a title, uh, to win a slam. Yeah, he he wouldn't have had to do that this this week because um, or this two weeks because uh, Ferrer's in his half. Ferrer's the big seed, right? Uh, in his half, but Ferrer's lost. Okay, Ferrer has lost at Indian Wells. He lost to um, Kevin Anderson. It's not really something to be proud of, is it? But then again, Kevin Anderson. I mean, it's <laughs> the balls are apparently. I mean, Joe Jury was saying earlier on that the. Um, um, on Twitter, she mentioned that the balls, luckily, were a little lighter, but the court was playing very grippy and slow, high bounce. Well, the court will be playing slow, but it'll be hot there. Right. Hot, so the balls will be travelling through the air, and it'll be quite bouncy. I'm assuming they use US Open balls. I don't actually know that, but I'm pretty sure they do. And How, those much, difference? Quite... How much difference? And I mean, uh, I'll never know what it's like to play in Indian Wells and Florida and places like that. And you've done these things. How much difference does a ball make... Um, how much the difference does temperature make to the actual flight of the ball? Oh, a lot. A heck of a lot. I mean, if you think about it, even with any sport, even sort of, uh, you know, if, if you think about leaving tennis balls in the car overnight, I mean, you know, I know now because I'm doing a lot of coaching stuff. If you leave your tennis balls in, in the car overnight and it's cold, yeah. they go flat. Right. So it's, it affects the pressure in the balls. Okay. Um, so, so the flatter ball would suit Rafa, or because it stays flat, low. The flatter ball would probably it probably suit a Djokovic because it'll all be in here and it won't be going through the court that fast. Okay. So Federer would want it bouncy and lively, and Rafa would probably want it quite lively yeah. to get the ball. Federer would want it what, bouncy out. and lively against anyone but Rafa, who can get it up to his backhand, I guess. Pretty much. But then, if it's not bouncy and lively and it's dead and it's not going anywhere, how's he going? He's not going to be able to hit through Rafa because the balls aren't giving him enough. Right. So he okay. probably would still rather it was okay. It was lively, but it's sort of uh, it's just you know the hotter it is, the less sort of it's quite difficult to explain it. When it's cold, you can kind of feel that it's cold and grey and cloudy you can kind of feel that the air is just heavier right Moisture even if you're just wa- even if you're just walking around yeah, yeah. so if it's beautiful and crisp and you know really hot 
yeah. then the balls are just flying through the air much faster. Um, and again, it's a difficult thing to sort of, I don't know, judge and measure, but it's just obviously how players feel. And, and a lot of these guys, tiny little differences in feel is, is everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard a story once that Sampras, so, cause I, I knew Sampras is a stringer. Right. The guy who used to Nate stream. Ferguson was it? Or? It's somebody who works with Nate, Ron Yu. Okay. He works for the same company. So he said, uh, yeah, he used to go to, he used to go to San Francisco's house, string his records, send, he'd send them back, he'd, you know, he'd send them off, he'd come back with them the next day. And uh, he used to string at the same tension all the time. And uh, he came back to Ron one day and said, something, something's different with this record, what have you done? And Ron was like, well, I haven't. It's exactly the same tension. He's like, feels strange, something, something's different. Have you used the same grip? Exactly the same grip. He'd used a slightly different uh, string paint to what? paint the W on. No way. And somehow, Sampras felt the difference. Are you serious? Yeah, I mean, coming from, you know, I've obviously got to a fairly decent level, I would have absolutely no idea how to feel that. So, it shows the difference between, you know, yeah. the greats and the also rounds, I guess. So. Talking of Sampras, I just want to stop you there. There's, um, I was in a news agency in my house today, and I bought these two rackets for three pound ninety five each, which kind of tells me the sort of margins that some of these racket manufacturers make on tennis rackets, because it's an aluminium frame. It's the same construction as almost any of the, apart from the battle lab ones, which are the best in the world. Um, but all the other ones, it's um, pretty much the same construction, but it looks like the Sampras racket. You saw it. It's yeah. got a tiny head like that. V going down the throat. In fact, it looks a bit like the Connors racket, though, doesn't it? I'm too old for that. Uh, too young for that. Sorry. Yeah, whatever. But um, I'm looking forward to using that on the tour. I'm going to chop the handle down to make it 21 inches, and it's just going to be just like the pro stuff. And I will get the tongue out and start cocking my front foot. Yeah. Well, you know, you may as well just uh, adapt to the adapt to things. You've got to be like your idol. That's the beauty of touch tennis, yeah. isn't it? Play like, yeah. play like the people play you like want to be. Yeah, exactly. But uh, what else? So uh, Anderson taking up Ferrer, and you were saying earlier on that that meant that the draw meant Rafa, his seed was out of the way. Um, um, not necessarily, because Rafa is actually in Federer's bit. Okay. So whoever wins out of the, the I assume, the, the quarterfinal that is Federer and Nadal yeah. will play somewhat. I mean, judging by... Judging by the draw that I'm going to look at now, you know, you've either got probably probably Burditch is going to come through that. So it'll be Burditch in the semis, which is tough one for Rafa, isn't it? Tough for Rafa, That's yeah. Tough. Roger, Roger seems to have him. But yeah. then again, if Rafa's just got through Roger, then I think he'll be feeling yeah. pretty good. Um, but it's interesting to see, you know, Nadal and Federer in the quarters. Yeah. When was the last time that happened of a tournament? Uh, Two thousand and. I'll tell you when it was. It was 2005 in Miami. Really? Mm. Before the quarterfinals that they met. Oh. First time that's happened. It was in the round of 32. You can phone in and tell me I'm wrong, but I'm never wrong. It was in the round of 32 in Miami, and it went to five sets, and it was their second meeting. That's the last time it happened. In 2004, he also met him in the same round at Miami. Rafa went two sets to love up. It was the time Rafa beat him. Um, seems too. It seems too. Uh, so five. Recently. Hang on. Let's just go five. It couldn't have been a final. It seems too recently. What? Too recently? Two thousand and five. Yeah, for them. Eight to be. years ago. Eight years ago. It's a long time ago, mate. God, I'm getting old. Yeah. I'm getting old. Eight years. <clears throat> Remember, Rafa's dominated at the French for seven years. Mm. These, but there well, was one gap where he missed one. But two thousand and five, he won it. Six, seven, eight. 9, 10 he lost, 11, 12 he won as well. So he's won his 7 French Opens, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, um, 11, 12. 7 French Opens he's got. Yeah. From 2005? Yeah. So surely he would have been seeded in, in, in Miami. Maybe it was in the final, but it must have been the year before, 2004, where he lost to Rafa. Yeah, for five sets, it would have to have been the final, wouldn't it? Yeah. They were still playing five set finals in the Masters. Yeah, so, sorry, I'll stand corrected there for the first time in my life. I'm less wrong than normal. <laughs> um, you know, I'm less right than normal. I'm never wrong, let's be honest. Um, and they met in 2004 in Indian Wells, in, sorry, in Miami, and Rafa beat him in three. Okay. Um, and that was their first encounter. And so, when he went two sets to love up the year later, everyone was like, whoa, what's going on? Is this going to be the guy that's got Federer's number? And somehow Federer just 
battered through him, you know, just managed to clock every backhand from there up the line for winners. But that was long before Fed Rafa had improved his backhand. Yeah, exactly. That's when he's just but yeah, so 2004 you have to go back to. So Yeah, yeah so it'll be, it'll be strange, strange for those guys. I mean, you know, it's just going to be... It's just going to make Grand Slams tougher to win now, I mm. guess, for the for the top guys because they could well have to come up against, you know, certainly next the next couple because he's not going to win any more points in the French uh, in the clay court season. He yeah, because you can't gain any more points um, unless you play ev- every tournament that comes along. Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing, the interesting thing, and I, I guess you got you guys can tweet in and let us know your views on this. Should Rafa get seeded four at Wimbledon? Because Wimbledon still have the old-fashioned seeding system, the, the right to change the seeding. So every other tournament goes on ranking, but Wimbledon still reserve the right to seed who they want, wherever they want. So right. if they really wanted to, they could seed you number one. Well, interestingly, <laughs> at the Touch Tennis Hall in England, it is also the only <laughs> slam where we don't um, recognise rankings, but we base it on grass court pedigree. Pedigree, and uh, oh, who have we got here? Someone calling in. Hello? 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 It's Ed Corey. Ed hey. Corey, how you doing, mate? Yeah, good. How are you guys? Very good, very good. Good to have you on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the presence of greatness. Mr. Edward Corey from uh, Gosling, or I don't know where you're from, some scummy Essex place. Um, he's <laughs> on the phone. Hertfordshire, sorry, even worse. Have you ever beaten Surrey at anything? That's the worst. <laughs> well, that's not really hard. Oh, really? Ed, on. that's not a question he just asked. Don't worry about it. We'll ignore <laughs> that question. Um, how's things going with you this week? I've seen that you, uh, you've you basically not been losing this year, uh, which is a very, very good way to very, very good way to have a tennis career. Is uh, But if you, if you don't lose, you'll do very well. So... Um, yeah, just give us a quick, because obviously we had you on the show beginning of the year, give us a quick summary of, of what's gone on for you so far. You've played five or so tournaments? Uh, yeah, I've started, just started my seventh today. Seven, okay. So, yeah, so um, went up to Glasgow to start the year, um, played okay there. It was definitely a bit weird getting back into matches um, after such a long training block, but uh, made the quarters there, and then... Preston the next week picked up a win, my first Futures win, so that felt good. Beautiful. And then final the week after that, uh, won the week after that in the Wirral, and then there was a two-week break, and then uh, I just headed to Cardiff where I lost in the final. To I'm sorry, there was a two-week break. Hang on, there was a two-week sorry, break. Can we talk about yeah, was... something slightly more important than that, where you sure, actually went? Sure. What did you do? Yeah, what did so, you do? Yeah, what did you do in your two week break, Ed? Luckily, on the middle weekend, I was able to finally make my touch tennis debut, uh, where I played some okay stuff before getting cuffed in the quarters. <laughs> you almost like the New York Bayonets of touch tennis. Shaka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's big. He's easy. They call him Shakers. Yeah, he's um. On the back of that event, actually, we've um, secured a Babalat sponsorship for him because he's uh, he's a quite a character, isn't he? Awesome. I think he deserves it. I mean, the guy's the rising star of touch tennis, playing with pure power and emotion. Yeah. And um, what about your match before that? Um, the, the toughest match, Yeah, really. I think... I mean, I'm trying to remember, but... They were all pretty routine until I played Shackers, but I think I played <laughs> the current... The current owner and CEO of the Cut Tennis. <laughs> he took up a decent fight. Um, I'm sorry, but there's a video of um, of, of me hitting uh, what, what I think you know is an unbelievable rally where I'm, I'm pretty much cuffing you. Um, that's the only video I've seen me hitting backhand winners past you. Yeah, we just got to ask who does the editing on this kind of video. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I heard it's an outside company. Um, when, when I find out who it is, I will let you know. Exactly. So what what happened? What happened in the tournaments after your after your break? Yeah, so I led break and then um, into Cardiff, where I made another final. So I actually managed to get to four finals in a row. I lost to uh, Freddie Nielsen, who popped in from his ATP tour life for ten thousand in Cardiff, <laughs> yeah. and uh, proceeded to chop everyone for five days. What do you um, think that was about? What was he doing there in Cardiff? So then he's off to Indian Wells, then Miami, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he went. He decided 
because he hadn't been able to get in some of the ATP events to play singles, and obviously he still likes playing singles. And even more than that, he likes playing on the British indoor quick. So he wanted to come and get some matches, bit of confidence, all that stuff. And he arranged. He went to see his beloved Liverpool on the uh, on the Saturday afternoon as well. So he had a good trip, I think. Fair enough. Okay, so so far this year, you've gone three finals, a win, and a semi. I uh, did, uh, yeah, quarters, two wins, two finals, and a semi. Two wins, two finals, and a semi. Okay, so you've probably got the best winning record of any tennis player playing at the moment. Um, so going from the end of last year, which you were you were looking at, you know, a good week would have been a semi. Is that pretty fair? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was... You know, quarters, semis, and I think a couple of finals, or one final, yeah, so I've been the quarters and semis. Okay, so what, what's made the difference for you? What do you think the big difference has been? Um, a few things we worked hard on over the break were uh, getting my mental routines down, um, meaning pre-match, how I warm up, how I get my mind ready, during the match, between points, and then after the match, and getting those kind of locked in and, and tampering with those a little bit so I felt comfortable every match and that gave me a great chance to kind of repeat each time because every time I just get back in the groove I wasn't thinking too much and I was able to sort of just keep it rolling um, and then we did a lot of work on my forehand uh, trying to get more easy power on that wing and although it's got a long way to go still I've just increased it you know enough to make a difference in those matches I was losing two tight sets I'm now coming out in two tight sets and uh, those are the two major things okay so you think you think that routines is 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 the big thing because I've seen I've seen and I know from experience that a lot of players they have one great week win a tournament or make a final and then they're out first or second round the next week because they can't quite you know they can't back yeah, it up yeah. you you think just having those set routines of during the match, before yeah, exactly the match, right. after the yeah, match. Yeah, but we went into quite a lot of detail with the mental routine, so it just becomes just more of a process, you know, point in, point out, game in, game out, and just keep trying to just do the same thing over and over. And that's because I've been down in a lot of these matches. You know, in Carl, if I was a set and 40 down, two matches in a row, I was able to come back and stuff. I haven't been, you know, kind of panicking. I kind of just kept my head down, kept working, and, and played enough good stuff. Okay, but that that's you just rope a dope, huh? That you just sucking your opponent in. Yeah, absolutely. Sucking your opponent into a full set. Yeah, exactly. I learned that one from Rashid, of course. Yeah. One sucker in and then yeah, back mean, with the shaped body. I did that with you at the Touch Tennis Tournament in Bromley, but then when you got three one up in the second set, I I was that was when I was about to make my comeback and Cavadet said, Look, we've got to get on with the doubles. Can you hurry up and start doing the draw for me? So I thought, Oh, better throw this match. Otherwise I would have you know, if I'd had time I would have come back and beaten you. Oh, of course, and no doubt, no yeah. doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, so I mean, I guess you're you're at the stage now where just winning is a bit boring. So you kind of you know give give your opponent hope, give yourself a bit of a challenge, or I'm setting a breakdown. Rashid has actually yeah, taken I that wish. to new. Rashid's taking that to new levels. He's just so sick of winning. He just loses now. Yeah, just so bored of it. Yeah, he's so <laughs> sick of winning. He can't he can't get him in anymore. Yeah, he's just like, oh, winning's boring. I'm gonna lose. See what that feels like. Yeah. Um, so Ed, where, where are you off to next after this week? You've got um, you know, a good run. You're still there on Tuesday. It's a good run by a lot of people's standards. But um, you know, but, you know, people don't realise. I mean, jokes apart, try qualifying for a 10k futures. I mean, if you think it's easy, just try qualifying. That's hard enough. You'll have to play one, two, sometimes three matches to get through to against some hungry players, ridiculously hungry guys. You've got to get through them, and then you've got to win around to still be there on a Tuesday night. So you're there now. You're, you're at the tournament. What, what's next for you after this event? Uh, so I play here in Bath, and then there's one more um, 10,000 in Sunderland next week. That'll kind of finish this long indoor stretch. Okay. In Britain, I'm going to go uh, have a week off and then go to a challenger in France. And then um, a couple of weeks after that, I think I'll head to... Uh, Greece um, for a couple of times before trying to get in a uh, see if I can sneak in main draw in a Uzbekistan challenger. Well, you reckon that week that you're off, you might be able to sneak around here and get some uh, green sessions going. Yeah, exactly. I need. Oh, well, 
one thing's for sure, I still need to work on my Dutch tennis game. Yeah. I'm limited. Yeah, you are. All right, beautiful. Well, Ed, thank you so much for giving us a ring. Uh, really appreciate it. And obviously, uh, you know, I'm sure you have to do all your other media commitments for being uh, <laughs> the... Uh... Now he's going to do it in French, German and Spanish yeah, exactly. as well. Yeah, I tried very good, hit the ball, but, you know, I play very good match. Exactly. So I think you're going to be, you know, Futures Player of the Year. Um, we're thinking about getting Tom Corey on at some point, uh, as he is most definitely Coach of the Year so far. Um, so we'll uh, we'll try to keep it in the family. But thank you so much for giving us a ring, mate. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's cut himself off. What's going on? Oh well. Well. Yeah. yeah now we've <laughs> cut. Yeah. No, we've cut you off. Yeah. Yeah. We cut you off, Ed. Then ring in my show and tell me you hang up. Anyway, we Jeez. wish we wish Ed the best of luck. And no, we don't. Now he hung up on me. Thick <laughs> ears. Hope you get smoked tomorrow. Love and love. Uh, um. But no, yeah, I agree with you. Ed, thanks for calling in. Appreciate it. But uh, yeah, I don't know what happened there. Oh, there is he. He's back. Hello? It cut off. Just when you mentioned Tom Curry, I think my phone got upset about it and just cut me off. <laughs> no, we're thinking of having him on the show as Coach of the Year. Um, but, uh, no, no. but anyway, Ed, um, best of luck for the rest of this week. Thank you so much for giving us a ring. Um, and uh, no doubt we'll hear from you or see you on the show, on the Touch Tennis Tour and generally around pretty soon. Great. Thanks, guys. Oh, by the way, Ed, um, in case you watch this show on replay, that's exactly what I was just saying. That I wish you all the best tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Take care, later, mate. mate. Bye. So yeah, Led Corey, thank you very much for calling in. We wish you all the best tomorrow. I hope you win your match. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, yeah, people don't know what it's like in terms of the grind of winning. I mean, I I see Facebook updates. Jason Malik, you know, guys like Lewis Burton, just talking about they're playing a match and you know lost so close, lost seven six six four, just to get into a a ten k futures. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that the thing that stands out for me about what we what we've just talked to Ed about is um, so let's go at the end of at the end of next week, not the end of this week, the end of next week. We're going to be at uh, almost the end of March, right? So we'll have one week of March left. So he's basically done uh, a month, no, two months, uh, two and three quarter months, I guess, right? Mathematically, two and three quarter months, and he's played eight tournaments. Yeah, I mean. What Federer's played three? Yeah. Murray's played two? Yeah. Maybe three? Federer's played two. He didn't play any warm ups. Did he play Went no straight to the Australian Open and now he's gone straight to Indian Wells. That's he, he, he Oh no, Rotterdam. One more. He played one more. Rotterdam, yeah. yeah so Federer and Murray. Did he lose to Julian Benito? That was it. Yeah. So Federer and Murray have both been have both played three tournaments. Yeah. So that's why I guess people say if you're playing on the futures tour you're you're on the grind. Yeah. Because it seriously is. I mean he's obviously lucky enough to have played eight tournaments in the same country his own country so that's that will be a pleasure but from now on he'll be he'll be racking up some serious air miles and right. potentially looking at the same sort of number of tournaments so right it's pretty uh it's pretty brutal lifestyle pretty tough stuff so you know we we obviously wish ed and all the rest of the british guys who are who are battling around the futures tour yeah. the best of luck but it's we you know it's, it's nice to hear it's nice to hear exactly what he thinks makes a difference yeah, because the like routines that yeah the mental yeah. routines it's interesting how much how much emphasis he's putting on the in fairness he is a bit thick and kind of simple minded <laughs> so for him oh forehand breathe in breathe out oh <laughs> backhand oh no that's the wrong way yeah. oh no out. what's the score yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's actually a smart enough guy but yeah it's interesting how much emphasis and how much uh, how specific it seems like he goes in goes into sort of the details of the mental side of the game yeah and Maybe that's make that is what's making the difference. It's a brutal game. I mean, let's face it. I mean, it, you've got what do they say? Eighty percent of the time, you're not even hitting a ball. It's like, all that time just to think, and it's 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 even worse. Like in touch tennis terms, when you're playing guys like Matthew Watson or Rob Gilmore, because they're so ugly, and you have to look at them when you're not playing a point, and you, you know you're trying, you're retching. And you're watching these gangly people, and then when you do hit a ball, you got all that time while you're thinking of what they're going to do because they take a week to get there, and then they just go <clears throat> just grind it back higher. So you've got all that time between points. So that's you know another mental aspect. If anyone's got any ideas on how to beat filthy grinders like that, journeymen, hopeless people, and they're hooking you, 
if you've got any opinions on being hooked like I was the week before last, um, call in. In the meanwhile, we're just going to quickly have a look at what happened. Um, a few of the matches at Bromley. There's The first part is obviously me winning matches, me being hooked. A bit of uh, Marcus Willis and that brutal call at the end where Shaq Lady thought he'd hooked him. And the ball was, in fact, that far out. I've done a little edit at the end. Obviously, the edits of me hitting winners wasn't me. Someone else did that. Yeah. But the edit at the end, you'll see the ball land very far out, Shaq Lady, you filthy cheat. Sorry, yeah, we're finishing with that um, unbelievable um, backhand winner from me against Shaq Lady. He went on about his serve and how big it was and stuff, and I was just teeing off winners off it. There's about 20 of those for me, but Willis played really badly. Yeah, well, what can you say? Some people return better than others. Yeah. Um, we have these. Um, if you're interested, if you can see those on the camera, you should be able to see those. Uh, Chris has one too. Yeah, you turn. Just call in and you have a question for us, you'll get one of these. One of the first people to call in will get one. We'll send one to Ed Corey already. Does he play with Dunlop or Head? Ed, I think, is just signed with Dunlop. All right, okay. Certainly not Head. Oh, okay, so you won't want one of these then? You never know. No, we'll, we'll keep it. If he comes around here and he wears a short tie, you can have one. <laughs> um, and his socks. But, um... Who have we got here? That looks like Nick Lester. Um, let's have a look. Hello? Hello. Is this for Shield? It is indeed. This it is. is Hi. Ian Wells calling. Sorry? This is Ian Wells calling. 
Indian Wells calling. Indian Wells, Mr. Lester, how are you doing? <laughs> are we still on air? We are indeed. Thank you very much for calling in, Nick. Uh, for those of you watching at home, we have Nick Lester in. Our man on the ground is in Indian Wells. Um, he'll send us a video piece, but he was busy doing a, a video chat with Songa just then, so he couldn't get to us early enough to send us a clip. I hope you're well in the 34 degree heat. It's, it's tough over here. I mean, it's in the low 90s, like cloud in the sky. I'm watching the best tennis players on the planet. And uh, how are you doing anyway? Um, um, next question. <laughs> it's winter, it's minus 800. Yeah, I know your request, your request was to ask Joe Walford Songa uh, to voice a piece telling you, telling you that you were the greatest or the greatest of all time at touch tennis, but sadly, the ATP only gave me a minute and a half with him, so I didn't quite have time to get that question in. But uh, ah, Joe sure. Walford, I'll send his regards to you, Rashid, of course. Of course, yeah, as always. Um, if he wants any tips or any advice, Get, get him to, uh, you know, give me a call. I'll, I'll, I'll help him out with his career. Because, I mean, he's, he's trying to make that next transition. And, and in all seriousness, he's gotten together with Roger, Roger Rashid, who's a bit of a, you know, man's man, thump on the back sort of guy. Do you think that's going to have the desired effect? Well, listen, I was just saying to him earlier, he's got seven kilograms. One of the things Rashid's going to do uh, uh, is basically just to try and be a little bit more steady, try and be more consistent. Uh, which with which Rashid now, are you talking about? Try to focus. A, a little bit longer at times, and uh, yeah, he's definitely in better shape. He's just beaten Marty Fish seven six seven six in a, in a match that first up this morning. So that was pretty decent. Obviously, Marty Fish, his first tournament back here, Rashid. He's had nine months away. Talked about retirement, contemplating retirement. Still is contemplating retirement. Marty Fish. He's going to play Miami, and he's going to see how it goes from there. Um, mm. But yeah, it was it was a good match to start the day, and, and you know, Songa Songa. He's the, he's the best of the rest, isn't he? Let's be honest, yeah. as far as you know, the second crop of players go with Del Potter and the others. So, uh, and he's, you know, he's put bums on seat, so it's good to see. It's a shame he hasn't won a slam, and Del Potro has. Um, because I never felt that Del Potro won the slam. It was more like Federer gave it to him. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, Songa had his chance at the French with match points against Djokovic and didn't take them. Yeah, and then of course he had to get through Nadal. So I think he's probably, he's probably to be fair, he's better chance to win Wimbledon a couple of years, weren't they? When of course he had some decent beat. You beat Djokovic, I think, at Wimbledon a couple of years ago. So you know, let's be honest, if he's going to win a slam, it's going to be probably on quick courts, isn't he? He's never really, yes. never really going to be a play quarter. I think he tried to improve that side of his game. But Rashid's obviously worked with Maltese uh, as well, so he's, he's used to dealing with these sort of a little bit flaky Frenchmen, if you like. Frenchman. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, but I mean just. Just in general, this is just—I mean, if you're, I, I must just say, whoever's watching, if you ever get a chance to come to a tennis event, this has got to be the one. This is incredible out here. Just I've never been to, to a. It, it's almost like walking into like a tennis heaven out here. It's is sort it of in the middle, of, nowhere, in the middle of the desert, um, and it's just astonishing what they've done with this event. The crowds here are huge. The event's so well organised. Um, weather's perfect. All the players are here. You get such good access to the players. If you're a fan, you can just walk around. There's like a football pitch the players are playing on as you come in. Uh, uh, just fantastic. I mean, I, I'll probably have to say Monte Carlo's made just kick its deal, but as a tennis tourist, if you're ever thinking about coming to a tennis event, yeah. I'll tell you what, this would be right up there. Um, question for you. Who's the guy that runs it? Is it Charlie Passerell? Sorry? Is it still Charlie Passerell that runs it? Yeah, no, he's not. This is his last. This is his first year. He's not been involved, actually. I mean, no Larry Ellison owns this event. Yeah, he's obviously like the six, the billionaire richest man in the world, or whatever. Well, isn't he Oracle um, or something? He's like absolutely minted. Yeah, uh, he is. Yes, and uh, he. Uh, I don't couldn't quite hear you there, but he's from Oracle. He, his money came from Oracle. Yeah, he, he knows all the players. He hit with Rafa a couple of days ago. Pretty much whatever he says in this event goes. It's, it's an open sort of checkbook for him, really. So um, they just continue to build. They're building a main stadium too here. They're, they're building a permanent stadium too. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really can't speak highly enough of the way that this event's organised. And, and it, as I say, it's, it's a little bit of a, an open checkbook with regards to the way it's run. So could you ask so Larry Ellison? If, could you ask him if he wants to put a touch tennis tournament in? <laughs> Do you know what? Given how much of a, how much he loves the sport, it might be worth an email. If I can get his email for you, I will, Rashid. All right? Yeah, you're a hero. I feel sorry for that man already. He will just get harassed. Yeah. Maybe I'll give that one a miss then. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, Joe Tapar... I'd like to be here next year, you know. <laughs> you know that um, I interviewed Larry Ellison 13 years ago for a film we made about Oracle. That's why I remember the name. 
Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I made the but he took, over, he took over ownership about five years ago, and he actually owns the Malibu Racquet Club, which is linked with this event, which is right uh, just about, about two hours drive from here. That's that's where he, that's the main club he owns. But this is the tournament he now owns. He bought from, as you say, from Charlie Passarell and from Ray Moore. They were the two people who owned this event previously. So he now took it over and uh, is the man in charge. Okay, so who are you calling? Who are you calling for the for the title? Who's going to win? Out of Rafa uh, and Roger? Well, what I mean, it's, going out, it's not going out on a limit to say that Djokovic is probably your favourite. I mean, Roger's got a little injury, picked up a back injury yesterday. He was really kind of hobbling almost with the last couple of games against Dodic, but he doesn't, I'm not quite sure he's, he's good enough. Obviously, the weather's pretty hot here this week, so conditions are going to suit, should suit Roger in that regard. Rafa plays Gorbis in the next round, which is going to be fascinating. Mm. It's Gorbis. Uh, it's on like a 15 match win streak now. I think it's a 14 match win streak, getting qualified in Delray, won there, qualified here. He's won three matches here. He's snapping rackets left, right, and centre. He's talking nonsense as always. So he's great fun. Uh, and, yeah, he uh, melted a frame, didn't he? Here yesterday. In fact, it was a 5.1 earthquake, and Gorbis said he didn't feel a thing, <laughs> which is kind of in line of the guy himself, really. So, yeah. uh, but listen, you know, Rafa Gorbis tomorrow night, I think it's going to be brilliant. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, who's your uh, pick for Miami? The humidity. Um, yeah. Very different ball game. Isn't I mean, it? Uh, I, I, I'm not even sure, to be honest, Rashid, who's going to be there. Federer's not playing. Rafa's not even. Rafa's entered, but I'm not sure he's going to be there. I suspect he probably will, in wow. truth. Um, but totally different conditions. I mean, here it's a dry heat. Obviously, it's a very dry heat. The ball yeah. jumps around here. It, it picks up off the surface. In Miami, it's very different. It's a little flatter. You know, obviously, the, the humidity over there uh, makes the ball just that little bit softer. It's not as, it's not as quick in Miami as it is here. So. That probably will suit somebody a little bit more like Rafa, who's able to have a little bit more time on the ball. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there is a lot of talk about how this event has, is, is dwarfing Miami at the moment because the amount of money they put in here yeah. and, and everything else and, and what they've done to this event is almost making off Miami look like a sort of poor relation. Miami's yeah. owned by IMG. Um, this one, obviously, owned by Larry Ellison. So, you know, it's tough yeah, because yeah, on the men's side, this is the Masters 1000. Now, of all yeah. the Masters 1000, this right now stands alone and uh, in terms of prize money and everything else of course they've up the prize money here a lot first round losers took 20% more here this year than they did last year so mm-hmm. you know as I said they, they just put so much into this and uh, outside this, this has a major feel to it listen I mean you know this yeah. may not be a major in name but I mean, being here for a week already it, this this is a major in all but name I'm telling you yeah brilliant well, they used to call Miami the fifth major, and uh, I do remember Charlie Passarell always wanting this tournament, Indian Wells, to be the fifth major. Um, yeah. And if you're saying it's starting to feel like that, you know, who knows? Maybe we can get uh, it. Is, uh, and, and, and the crowds are fantastic, Rashid. I mean, every single day the outside courts have been absolutely packed. And it, it's a little bit like walking around the US Open or, or French Open, where you sort of wander around off the main show court. Yeah. You can go to be a little quieter outside, no chance. The, the stands are absolutely packed. Oh, some brilliant. unbelievable matchups as well, and then partly that comes because it's a 96 draw. Yeah, you know, 96 draw takes mm-hmm. out. Uh, you know, whereas in a slam, first two sort of three rounds can be a bit quiet. I think it's all the Australian Open here. The early rounds have just been fantastic. Some great matchups today. We've got Djokovic against Dimitrov coming up next on the main show court behind me yeah. in about 10 minutes' time. I mean, that's just a great third round match, and yeah. uh, you know, fortunately, I'll be going to have a look at that in a second. Of course, mm-hmm. you will. <laughs> well, Nick, thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> Um, our man on the ground, Nick Lester, thank you so much for calling in. I know it's busy out there for you and it's tough getting a suntan lotion and, you know, Malibus and, you know, Virgin Coladas, whatever it is you're drinking um, between matches. But, I, I, you know, I, I wish you all the best. I hope you don't burn in the sun um, and, you know, that it doesn't hurt too <laughs> much right. when it reddens at the back. Yeah, um, that makes one of yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Lester, thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, guys. Take, take care. care. Soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Well, that's Nick Lester on the ground there. Um, but, uh, yeah, before we go, there's a couple of things I'd like to talk about, um, and that is Touch Tennis. We're on Sky Sports. Uh, we will be on from... Um, there's a showing at 2.30 in the morning, uh, which is a bit early, uh, but if you're eager, you could set it to record and you could be up to watch it on Sky Sports 2, 3, and 4. And then we're on Sky Sports 2, 3, and 4 again, at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon during the Trans World Sports Show, and we've got a seven and a half minute feature all about touch tennis. 
Um, so I'm pretty pumped about that. And you haven't seen anything of no, this? No, You don't know what it's going to be I like? I've seen nothing. They could just be laying into touch. Yeah, they could just half be, minute. yeah. Oh, they could be abusing me for seven and a half minutes. I mean, the guy got me to do some really stupid things as well. But that'll be great fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'll watch that. <laughs> yeah, I'm up for that. So uh, there was an option of coming around here and playing poker on Wednesday night. Anyone wants to stay up till 2.30, then watch the match, smoke a couple of cigars. I am tempted to do it. I think it'd be the manly thing to do, but you're being a bit ladylike. Yeah, that sounds that sounds a bit late for me. I have bedtimes and things like that these days, so uh, you know, God help us all. <sighs> Need but, your uh, uh, milk and we'll cookies, see. do you? We'll see. We'll see. It depends what I'm doing the next day. I think. Yeah. Um, but it, it'll be great to watch, and I think it's really important for obviously you know the fans of the show, the fan the fans of touch tennis to really get behind it and have a watch, and hopefully uh, you know we can get some more slots on Sky Sports soon enough. We've got a dumb question. Last tweet in from a guy called Tomo Davies. Um, <laughs> he said to me, I heard you like a little bit of banter. And I absolutely abused him. But fair play to him. He, um, he retweeted it, which I thought was quite nice of him. Showed that he's up for a bit of banter. And uh, he just asked how many people are signed up for Touch Tennis. At the moment, registered players, we have 1,187. Um, and we are regularly played. I'd say back of an envelope calculations about 5,000 players a month around the world. Um, and that's if you calculate the universities like Brunel, um, all the clubs, add them all up, University of uh, Edinburgh, Swansea, Cardiff, Australia, um, the weekly sessions that go on around the world, playing short tennis or touch tennis as, as we call it, um, it's about four or 5,000 people a month. So what I'm hoping for is that after this broadcast, we get that number up to 10, 15,000 a month uh, and that more money comes into the sport so that we can fund, from my perspective, selfishly, British tennis players who play long tennis. Um, and we can set up mini tennis courts around the United Kingdom and hopefully around the world for other people to be able to be exposed to the beautiful game of tennis through the avenue of touch tennis. So that's always been the plan. Let's, um, let's hope we can get there. Yeah, it sounds good. Sounds ideal. But uh, I want to thank Ed Corey once again for calling in. Um, Nick Lester for calling in from Indian Wells. Swine. Um, and as always, Chris Eaton, my co-host. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Um, thanks for your tweets, your texts, and thank you so much for watching. Um, we'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>